Oh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope you are having a good time uh, in Reinforce. I understand it's a long day, and we are approaching to the end of the event. However, we always leave the best to the end, right? <laughs> and um, welcome to this session. This is the NIS 30, uh, 305 session, Secure Your APIs the Directed Way, from Foundation to Parameter. My name is Jerry. I'm a Solutions Architect from the Cloud Optimization Success Team from AWS. Today, I'll be talking all things around API security, together with my colleagues, Frank and Syed, as well as George from our customer, Twilio, to share their journey to secure the APIs. Before we jump into the details, can we run a quick poll here? I promise no hard question at 4 p.m. this time. Just a quick uh, question to understand you better as uh, our audience. So how many of you are working in a role that's responsible for the API security and operation? Could you please raise your hand? Awesome, thank you very much. Seems we have a great turnout of the API folks here. Essentially, I believe this is a session for every one of us, given the API economy has become a general term in the industry. So let's take a look at what you can expect from this session. Firstly, we'll start from those common API security challenges that the whole industry is facing. Then we'll introduce the Wildtative framework, specifically the security pillar, and then help you to connect the dots for why the framework is important for you to use to protect and secure your APIs. And then we'll share with you some of the detailed design patterns that are aligned with the Wildtative best practices that we can use as a reference architecture. Next, we will have a Twilio to share their automatic solution that they built to secure the APIs at scale. Last but not least, we have uh, some further readings and documentation that we can share with you to take away after the session. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Let's start from those uh, common API security challenges. It might be easier for me to walk you through a simple scenario. So now let's imagine you're working in a role that's responsible for the API security. And um, you are actually responsible for the, for the security of the APIs uh, that provide the e-commerce services to your customers who might be selling the digital assets on your website, such as the photos and artworks. And as we know, we have a different type of the APIs technically. While in this session, we focus on the REST API, given this is one of the mostly used API type for our customers. In this case, you have the app server fronted by the API server to expose the e-commerce service to your consumers. And your business process requires all the users have to validate their identity before they make a purchase. So that's why your app server will have the integration with a downstream service provider, which will send the short message to your users on a per API request basis. So your users will be able to extract information from the short message and validate their identity especially before they make a purchase on the expensive artworks. So your APIs would become vulnerable if the proper control mechanism are not in place. For example, such as uh, the maximum number of the processes or the execution timeout. So what will happen is the malicious attackers will be able to compromise your APIs and then to send a large volume of the API request to the downstream service provider which will, again, send high numbers of the short messages to your users, which, on one hand, would um, impact your billing towards the service provider. Let's say, increase from 2K to 20K per month. On the other hand, it will also dramatically impact the service request raised by your legitimate users. And this vulnerability is commonly called as unrestricted resource access which is normally caused by the proper rate limiting mechanism is not in place. Apart from the impact to the downstream service provider, this vulnerability will also allow the malicious attackers to compromise your app server and consume a large volume of the resources there, such as the CPU and memory, which would again impact the service availability 
to your legitimate users. And of course, in the real world, you might most likely have the server cluster for both of your API and app server. You might also need to manage different versions of the APIs for your various environment, such as dev, test, and production. So managing all these environments and the servers can be heavy lifting for your team. And missing a critical security patching or simply just not able to keep all the configurations consistent across your servers can leave your server become vulnerable. And this vulnerability is normally called as the security misconfiguration, which will again increase the risk of your server being impacted by the DDoS attack or the distributed denial of service. In another case, your users might need to access their digital assets on your website before or when they find a potential buyer. So technically, you might have a whole bunch of the clients trying to access the object store within your bucket. But if for whatever reasons, if the proper access control are not in place, the chances are the malicious attackers will be able to access those objects that's not belonging to them, causing a data breach. And this vulnerability is normally called as the broken object level authorization, which is normally caused by overly permissive access control against your bucket. So now if uh, you feel some of the challenges that we mentioned here sounds a bit familiar, yes. That's because they're actually part of the OWASP API top 10 challenges. And if you're not familiar with the OWASP, it actually stands for Open Worldwide Application Security Project, which is a nonprofit foundation ever since 2001. And it's actually one of the de facto security standard to define the API security challenges, which have been deemed as the most critical by many of the industries. So let me give you an example. In AWS, we have WAF, or the Web Application Firewall, which have some of the managed rules that are defined and developed based on the OWASP top 10. We hope you won't be impacted by any of the challenges we listed here. However, we always need to be prepared to protect our APIs. So next, let's take a look at how we can secure our APIs. That's basically where the Wild Data Framework can come into play, because it will not only help you to set up a comprehensive security foundation and strategy to secure your APIs, but also it will help you to effectively navigate through those AWS best practices for API protection. If you're not familiar with the Wild Architecture Framework, it's actually a collection of the high-level best practices from AWS that can help you to build and run applications on AWS. It's actually structured across six different pillars, ranging from operational excellence, reliability, all the way to sustainability. And today in this session, we focus on security pillar. Within the security pillar, we organize all the best practices into the focus area, which would uh, highlight those uh, recommended architectural patterns and design principles for you to secure your APIs. For example, one of the best practices is to control and secure your network at all layers, which highlight the importance of building a layered network foundation for your organization. It ranges from the edge access application all the way down to database layer. And you should secure and control the network traffic at each layer. The Wild Data Framework not only provides you the best practices to showcase what the school looks like, it also shares with you the implementation guide to help you to get there. For example, to achieve the control network traffic at all layers, the implementation guide actually directs you to the relevant AWS native service, such as Amazon VPC, Amazon Route 53, and AWS WAF, which are fundamental building blocks to help you to set up a comprehensive security foundation. As of now, we have over 300 best practices across six different pillars. And again, we organize these best practices into the focus area. 
So let's dive deeper into it. As you can see, we have uh, six focus areas within the security pillar. And the first focus area is the Identity and Access Management, or IAM, which is about authentication and authorization of the AWS principles. It is to, to ensure only the right AWS principles, such as the people on the machine, will be able to access your AWS resource with the proper permissions. The second area is a detection, which is about the detection of the anomaly of the resource configuration changes or its uh, behavior. It provides you the necessary visibility for you to protect your AWS resources, such as uh, APIs. Then we'll have uh, infrastructure protection and data protection, which covers the best practices to help you to secure the compute, network, storage, as well as data in transit and data at rest. Next, we have uh, incident response, which is really about equipping your security people with the right tooling, skill set, and the process. So they will be able to remediate the incident should it happen. Last but not least is the application security, which provides you a whole bunch of the best practices to help you to set up the application CI-CD pipeline, automation, and code review, et cetera. So now you can see all these uh, six different focus areas come together to help you to set up a comprehensive security foundation. Now with the Wild Data Framework in mind, let's take a look at uh, those common API security challenges again. At the first glance, you might feel it's not easy to tackle and address all these challenges all at once. However, if we take a closer look at them, they actually have the natural relevance towards the security focus area that we just introduced, which are, again, IAM detection, infrastructure and data protection, incident response, and application security. So once you have this mind model and the mapping between the common API security challenges as well as the security focus area that we just introduced, it can help you to effectively navigate through those best practices as well as to find the right solution to tackle those threats. And if we take one step further, the Work Data Framework will also provide us the implementation guide, which would direct us to those relevant AWS security services to address the API challenges. So this is just one high-level view to share with you how can you effectively navigate through the best practices and also find the relevant AWS services to protect your APIs. All right, so probably enough high-level view for now. Next, I will hand over to Frank to walk you through some of the detailed design patterns and architecture that you can take away to secure your APIs. Nice one, Jerry. Thanks, Matt. Just making sure my mic is on. Hi everyone, my name is Frank. And I'm a security SA here at AWS. And I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Um, but obviously nice to be here with all of you today. So I'm going to talk about some ways you can use AWS services to mitigate some of the common API security challenges that Jerry outlined a bit earlier. And I'm going to use the focus areas of the well-architected framework to do that. And we're just going to focus on the first three of those uh, and, and align those with what Jerry talked about earlier. So again, we've got this mythical application and there's a service, one of the functional requirements of that app is that users need to be able to do something. Now, Jerry gave us an example earlier where they got sent a short message. It could also be something like they need to reset their passwords, for example. It could be anything. So that normally works great, except when it doesn't and something happens. So if you don't have the right controls in place, potentially what can happen is you can have users, malicious users perhaps, sending bogus requests into your service. And what will happen then is you'll find that CPU, memory, 
resources are basically going to get consumed and the idea is that those resources aren't going to be available for legitimate users. So we want to try and avoid that. And this is known as unrestricted resource access, resource consumption, whatever you want to call it. So that's the first challenge we're going to look at. The next one is security misconfiguration. That could mean just about anything. Again, I'm going to focus on one specific part of that. And the thing we're going to focus on is keeping resources patched. So we want to make sure that operating systems, code is kept up to date. And then the final one we'll look at is this broken object level authorization. And Jerry mentioned that earlier. So how are we going to do that? So I'll actually take the last one first. So broken object level authorization. We'll talk about identity in AWS. Now there's a couple of approaches we can take. Let's start off with a private API endpoint. Now, if your API doesn't need to be publicly accessible, then you don't have to make it that way. Instead, just expose it in your VPC um, to whichever users in your workforce actually need to use that API. So again, that removes the whole public access component of this. And with AWS, we've got a service called IAM. That integrates with every other service in AWS and enables you to create identities and write policies that are going to define how your resources are accessed. So in this particular model, uh, we've got IAM resource policies. So resource policies in AWS are policies that you attach to resources, things. It could be uh, Amazon API Gateway, um, it could be Lambda functions, it could be VPC endpoints. So actually pretty much everything in this diagram. This is an example of what a policy looks like. So that's just one block of a policy and essentially what it's saying is I'm going to give this particular principle access to this particular resource. There's other ways you can do this. So you can use attribute-based access control where you say, for example, that the common example we use is um, I've got this particular resource. That resource has some tags associated with it. I've also got some tags associated with my principle and I'm only going to allow the principle to do this thing if their tags match with the tags on the resource. So that's another approach you can take in IAM. So we've got these resource policies. I can also attach policies to principles. So in IAM, that's going to be IAM users or IAM roles. And then when the principal makes an API call, we're going to assess based on all those policies whether that principal is able to perform the action that they're requesting or not. Now, um, let's simplify this a little bit. So uh, let's say now you do need a public API. Everything that I've just said still does apply, but this time instead of having workforce users that are inside a VPC, now we've got potentially external users. So we want to give those users access. So in that case, we can use Amazon Cognito. So Cognito can function as an identity provider. So we store all our identities in Cognito. But equally, if you've got another identity provider, an external one, you can actually connect that to Cognito and just have Cognito handle the authorization. So um, what you can do in this case is with Cognito, the user logs in, they go to Cognito, and Cognito can pass them back a set of credentials. Those credentials can actually be used in AWS. So it's a set of IAM credentials. So for example, if a user needs to pull an object from an S3 bucket, you can do that because they'll have a set of credentials that are valid for them to do that. And all the things that I talked about just before in terms of having IAM policies and resource policies, all those things are going to apply in this case exactly as they do as if it was a workforce user. Now on top of that, if the user, so we've talked about uh, protecting your AWS resources, but you're also going to want to protect your actual application as well. And you can use Amazon Verified Permissions for that. That also integrates with Cognito. And Amazon Verified Permissions allows you to define authorization logic that applies just to your application. So if you've got an application, you have different types of users that access that application, you get to define for each of those groups of users or even individuals what things they're allowed to do and not allowed to do inside your application. So we can use those things to get a grip on this um, this challenge of broken object level authorization. Now, the second challenge we talked about was um, 
the security misconfiguration. And we talked, I mentioned that it was specifically in this case, we're going to talk about uh, making sure that resources are patched and that we're keeping up to date. How am I going to know the state of my resources and how am I going to go and fix any challenges that I detect there? So again, we've got this API uh, within API Gateway. And in AWS, services integrate quite nicely. So with Amazon API Gateway, that's going to send metrics and logs to Amazon CloudWatch. Now, in the case of metrics, I can use metrics insights in CloudWatch logs to understand my metrics. So, for example, it could be server-side errors, client-side errors, 4xx, 5xx, and a range of other types of metrics that are sent into that service. And I can gain insight into those and understand the performance of my application, how it's behaving based on that information. I can also take that information and define a threshold in a CloudWatch alarm. And if that threshold gets breached, then uh, we can take action on that. So for example, I can trigger a Lambda function, I can send an email to a security team, whatever I need to do, starting with that alarm right there. Then you also want to understand at the control plane what's happening with your APIs. So now you've got users that are managing your API, so they're using the API Gateway API itself. Wondering how many times I'm going to say API in this session, I'll, I'll try and reduce that a little bit. Um, and CloudTrail is a service that's going to record all that information for you. Now, you can send all that information to an S3 bucket, and then there's, once, once it's there, there's a number of things you can do with it. You can use AWS services or external services. Uh, so if you've got analytics tools, logging capabilities, I can get that information from that bucket and again give you insight into control plane activity for your AWS account and your admin users that are, that are administering this API. Then we've got AWS Config. So Config is a service that keeps a history of your resource configuration in AWS and, and now actually externally as well. And additionally, with config, you can create these things called rules. And a config, in a config rule, you define what you expect the configuration of your resource to be. So for example, it could be an EC2 instance. And if the resource gets changed by a user calling an API, config will detect that. And if that change falls out of your compliance rule, config will generate a finding. And that resource will be marked as non-compliant in relation to the rule. And again, you can take action on that. You can do it in config, you can do it in other services in AWS. Once we've recorded that information, then it's up to you how you handle that. Additionally, if you need to debug your application, you can send deep and detailed logs from Amazon API Gateway to Amazon Kinesis Data Firehose. And again, onto an S3 bucket, and whatever tools you're using to debug, you can then look at that data in the bucket. So let's dig into this a little bit further because I did talk about unpatched resources, right? So I want to cover that. So with Amazon API Gateway, it literally is a gateway for your, API, for your API and you're going to have uh, compute services behind that that are actually looking after your logic and, and doing all that good stuff. So there's two types of backends that you can have for an API Gateway API. First one is AWS Lambda. And the second one is just a HTTP backend, which means really you can connect anything that you like to, to your API gateway. So for any of those things, there's either going to be operating systems, there's going to be software packages. I want to understand if those things are up to date, and I certainly want to know if I have any open CVEs for any of those things. So how am I going to do that? So in AWS, there's a service called Amazon Inspector, actually. And Amazon Inspector will scan your resources, and it's going to look for exactly those things. And, the re and how it's going to do it is it's going to compare what it finds in your um, operating systems, in your, in your code packages, or in your container images, and it's going to look for open CVEs. And if it finds open CVEs against any of the packages that you're using, it's going to create a finding. All those findings get pumped through to Amazon EventBridge. It's a notification service. Uh, the, the service takes in the findings coming from um, Inspector or from GuardDuty. You can then create filters in that service just to look for particular findings that you're interested in. 
and when you get a match, you can send that off anywhere you like. It could be to AWS Systems Manager if you want to do patching. Uh, it could be to like another service, it could be to Lambda, for example, to Kinesis, to SMS. If you want to send a message to a security team, you can do all that with this service. Similarly, Amazon Guard Duty is a threat detection service. It's looking at a lot of information in your AWS account, everything from VPC throw, flow logs through to information in your S3 buckets and a whole bunch of other things. Your container, it's looking at the audit logs for um, EKS looking at EC2 information and if it finds something that it thinks is malicious activity again it's going to generate a finding. That finding again all those findings are going to go through to, to um, Amazon EventBridge and you're going to do exactly the same thing that I just described as with Inspector. So those services can help you deal with that second challenge of uh, security misconfiguration. Then the last one again we've got API Gateway and the last one we were going to look at was where we actually started, which was this unrestricted resource consumption or unrestricted resource access. So for starters, again, there's a couple of ways you can do this in Amazon Gateway, in, uh, sorry, Amazon API Gateway. You can put Amazon CloudFront, which is a content delivery network, in front of that service. We've got over 400 POPs in over 47 countries around the world. Um, and again, that service integrates with a lot of other services that are going to help you deal with this particular scenario. So for example, AWS WAF is a web application firewall. It's going to be very pertinent for dealing with this one. And I should say here, there's, there's certainly things that you want going to want to do either in app or around the app that are also going to help you deal with it. So Jerry mentioned like setting appropriate timeouts, for example. So if you do that on Lambda, it's pr pretty straightforward to go and set timeouts on Lambda functions. Um, set maximum, minimum file sizes, all that kind of stuff. You can absolutely do that. But here we've got AWS WAF. Uh, we're inspecting incoming HTTP requests. And in this case, WAF's got a few really useful features that are quite relevant. First is you can implement a capture with WAF. So a problem, like a challenge that a human's got to solve before that request even gets sent on to your, um, to your uh, API gateway endpoint. The second thing it's got is managed IP reputation lists. If an IP is on that list and you're using that list, that request's not even going to get through to your application. WAF's just going to drop it before it gets there. And the third thing is with WAF, you can implement um, rate-based limiting as well. So you get to define a time slice and you get to say for a certain source, and it could be a source IP, but there are other ways to do it as well, I'm only going to allow this many requests from this particular source in this time slice. So you can also restrict that way as well. Then there are other services that are going to help you with this from a more general perspective. Amazon Route 53 is a highly available fault tolerant DNS service, going to help your clients translate names from human readable names into an IP address so one system can contact another. And AWS Shield is going to help protect you um, from common network style attacks. It's going to help protect your resources and be able to defend against those. So, how do all these things come together and how do you deploy them at scale? I'm going to invite my colleague Syed and then our customer George from Twilio up to talk you through how to do this at scale. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Frank. Hi everybody, I'm Syed. I'm a security specialist at Syed AWS. I'm excited to be here today, Thanks. just like you are, to share some of those awesome things we have done, the things we have done with Twilio, one of our favorite customers here, to build AWS WAF as a service, using multiple AWS services. I'll give you a brief overview of these foundational blocks as we, uh, 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 as we go forward, and then George from Twilio will come around and tell you exactly the solution in detail. So let's get started. The first thing, not surprisingly, would be the AWS Web Application Firewall. What are the, some of the core features? First one, it gives you a multi-layered security that you can have for different types of threats. Example, DDoS, you know, something uh, Frank mentioned. You can also use for common uh, vulnerabilities as well. Um, the other great feature of WAF, if you have operated a WAF at scale at your enterprise, you probably are aware of this. Uh, 
uh, uh, that it takes a lot of upkeep. You have to fle you have fleets of servers you have to keep running. But with AWS WAF being a managed service, there is extremely low operational overhead when you're running AWS WAF. A few clicks and you get it get started. Um, customizable security, right? Your application is going to be different from somebody else's, right? And, and the threat landscape is changing all the time. AWS WAF allows you to bring your own rules. You can use AWS managed rules for the different types of threats that are out there. An example would be like, hey, I have uh, a database type application. I want some protection there. You can have rules for that. You can have rules for OWASP top 10 that uh, Jerry mentioned earlier. The other service that we have in this scenario is the AWS Firewall Manager. The Firewall Manager allows you to centralize your management. Any customer running AWS WAF or AWS at scale typically would have hundreds of accounts, right? And when you're having hundreds of accounts, imagine all the API gateways and all the resources that are typical in that kind of API model that Frank just shared, you have now thousands and thousands of resources. Now these hundreds of thousands of resources and hundreds of accounts, how are you going to make sure they're all protected and have consistent security baselines? That's where Firewall Manager shines through. What Firewall Manager allows you to do is to say, hey, I want for these resources, these WAF rules to be applied. But it goes further than that. It is not just AWS WAF, it's network firewall rules, it's security group rules. All these applied centrally for you across your organization. So if you have AWS organizations and you have all your accounts under there, with one service, with a few clicks, you're offsetting up a baseline, covering all your resources. Now you might be thinking, well that's great, but um, my environment changes. I have API gateways here today, today, I, tomorrow I might not, or we just made an acquisition. I need to bring another 100 accounts into my organization. The, because of the amazing uh, features of organizational uh, integration and config uh, integration into Firewall Manager, Firewall Manager is one able to detect that, any non-compliance with those new resources or existing resources, and then bring them back, help you bring them back into compliance. One more service in that foundational block, uh, block uh, is that Amazon Open Search Service. This is a managed service that makes it easy for you to perform analytics on your log data. If you are running a WAF-like application or API, you're going to collect a lot of logs. What are you going to do with all those logs? Um, logging is not monitoring. To be able to monitor those logs, you need to be able to uh, effectively query that vast amount of data. Now you could do that by running your own search clusters, but using a managed service like Open Search allows you to focus on real-time log analytics so you can do your application monitoring, find issues, and fix them, rather than manage fleets of search clusters. Being, uh, you can meet your security requirements using Open Search uh, by building on uh, trusted hardware and software of AWS and compliance requirements. Uh, using different types of storage tiers, you can optimize your costs. You might be running, especially when you're running a large enterprise WAF with all kinds of other logs also going in there, API logs maybe, CloudTrail and others, you are talking about petabyte scale, maybe exabyte scale at your organization. Using the data and keeping it in different tiers based on your use case is gonna help you allow you to uh, save costs on your open search service. And then, the so what of that is it gives you that observability, right? Observability is above monitoring. It's not just reacting. Observability is able to dive deep into what actually happened. And that allows you to then detect issues proactively and fix them. And also see if there are bottlenecks in your application based on the logs that you have collected. And at this point, to give you more details about how these services were put together, and uh, to build the amazing WAF as a service solution, I'm gonna hand it over to George from Twilio. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is George Gomez. I'm a security engineer and tech lead in Twilio's cloud security engineering department. So just a little bit about Twilio. Twilio was founded in 2008 and born in the cloud, specifically in AWS, with the goal to revolutionize the communication industry. Before Twilio, companies needed to work with large telecommunication giants to procure phone numbers, uh, purchase expensive equipment, 
um, invest in specialized engineers just to be able to send out a text message or place a phone call. This was something that was out of reach for most companies, uh, just reserved for large corporations that can make that sort of investment. Twilio changed all this by packaging these services into a simple to use API on a pay as you grow model. This made it, uh, this made it possible for companies of all sizes to be, able to, to be able to better engage with their customers. Fast forward 16 years, Twilio is now the leading, leading communications platform of, as a service provider with over $4 billion in annual revenue, over 306,000 customers worldwide, and facilitating 1.7 trillion interactions a year. These interactions is what makes it possible to send out a text message for your two-factor authentication code. They place phone calls for you to reach your customer service agent. They power IVR systems. They gather analytics on websites to provide better marketing campaigns, really empowering the global digital economy. I hope it's safe to say that Twilio is no stranger to APIs, and we understand the importance of protecting APIs, which is why we subscribe to the Well Architected Framework. And one of the ways we do this is by leveraging WAF as a service, specifically the AWS WAF. However, there's some challenges with uh, adopting or deploying an AWS WAF at an enterprise. Let's look at what some of those challenges are. So for starters, there's growing pains. As your, as your enterprise begins to scale, you start to adopt more and more AWS accounts. This could be to support your multiple applications. This could be for your different organizations that you might have acquired through an M&A. Or to maybe to create a separation of concerns when it comes to creating a different environments, production, stage, uh, development, right? Um, all these AWS accounts are going to have their own AWS resources. Uh, Internet-facing ones at that, right? CloudFront, API Gateway, Load Balancers all of which can have their own web ACLs, and in essence, their own WAF rules. So from a security perspective, you want to ensure that you're providing um, consistent uh, security controls across all these resources. And this becomes challenging at scale, right? You have all these independent resources deployed in such a large area in multiple accounts. It becomes challenging just to ensure that your baseline security controls are applied. This is further compounded with the, the, uh, the issue of resource coverage. We understand that our environments are not static, they're dynamic, right? We start to introduce new business lines. We may need a new endpoint to support that. Uh, we may start doing business in a different region. That's another endpoint, more AWS resources, and they also need the AWS WAF to provide those minimum protections, right? Those, those, those uh, controls. Um, likewise, uh, you, know, uh, you want to ensure that you're at least applying those security controls globally, right, in a, in a really effective manner. So, there's also the issue of poor observability. So by default, there isn't an out-of-the-box way to establish observability for WAF deployment. This is something that you need to design, you need to plan out, you need to engineer. And if you're like Twilio and you subscribe to a, a DevSecOps model where you empower your engineers to own their own resources, this means that they're gonna own their own uh, AWS WAFs as well. Well, they need to understand the importance of observability too. So, uh, and this becomes particularly important during testing. So let's take, for example, uh, we had a, an engineer that was tasked with uh, creating an AWS WAF uh, region rule, right? So they want to block, let's say, the Ukraine region. Ukraine's country code is UA. Let's suppose that instead of putting UA, they put in US. So let's think, that, let's think about that for a second. If they were to apply that, they could pretend this is a you know, US-based company selling goods in the US, they could potentially block a large percentage of their traffic, right? So establishing a level of observability so you can gather all this information helps you make better informed decisions on what's going on. Uh, you want to have centralized logging, like some sort of a single pane of glass, right? Centralized logging, maybe some visualizations, right? Some line graphs, you can, you can see the blocked request, maybe see a spike in that. Um, create alerts so that you can follow up and then, you know, reverse that change or better yet, never even apply it in the first place. Next, there's the issue of the increased time to remediate. So this becomes a problem. Uh, well, you know, vulnerability management teams, we understand that we're never going to be vulnerability free, right? Uh, but what makes an effective VM team is a team that's able to reduce that time to remediate as much as possible. Well, considering everything we just went over, 
this decentralized nature of the AWS WAF, all these resources with multiple owners, it can be quite challenging to follow up all these stakeholders to ensure that they are applying proper security controls, right? So let's take the Log4j um, issue uh, we had, uh, vulnerability we had a couple years back. So let's say we, there wasn't a patch for, for, for Log4j right off the bat, but security professionals were quickly able to create signatures and rules to help detect and in many cases block, block it at the WAF level. Well, you have thousands of resources deployed, you're now working with all these stakeholders to follow up and ensure that they apply this specific security control. That could be a Herculean effort to actually uh, accomplish. And it could take, you know, it could take uh, days, weeks, months, and the longer it takes, the more you're at risk, right? The more you're at risk of a compromise. So it, it really drives the point that having this decentralized nature really makes it difficult and really does drive the whole increased time to remediate. So understanding these challenges, let's talk about how Twilio looked at these challenges and started looking into AWS native solutions to address them. So, the solution we started looking into was AWS Firewall Manager Service, FMS. So, as I had pointed out, FMS allows you to create better governance behind your AWS WAF deployment, right? It lets you create security policies that can, be, uh, that can govern or help you manage the, those WAFs across your AWS organization. So, Twilio, that's exactly what Twilio did. We used FMS in combination with an infrastructure as code methodology through Terraform to create a holistic solution that would allow us to protect our APIs. So we did this by focusing on three main areas. The first one was by creating a security policy that we globally inherited across all our internet facing AWS resources. Resources like CloudFront, Application Load Balancer, and API Gateway. Uh, the security policy contains our security, the baseline security controls that we wanted to see applied throughout all our resources. So it included things like, uh, like uh, region blocks for, to, be, to meet our OFAC requirements, uh, IP allow and block listing uh, based off of intel that we received from our CTI team. Um, OWASP top 10 protections, of course. Right? All, they had all these security controls already applied, so leveraging the security policy, these resources globally inherit these uh, controls. We then expanded on allow, uh, using a tag-driven policy approach to supplement the globally inherited uh, policies. So what that means is we created a pair of security policies that were associated with an actual tag. So the idea behind that was to provide a more customized solution for specific resources, right? Not all applications are created equal. So let's assume we had a, a WordPress app. Well, on top of all the, rule, all the rules that I'd mentioned, we may want to have PHP specific rules. We may want to have rules to block uh, the WordPress admin page, for example. Uh, well, you can, you can do this by leveraging the tag. So the idea being that you can create a tag associated with a, with a specific security policy and it would add these rules on top of the globally inherited rules, giving the best of both worlds. So you have these security baseline controls, but you also can supplement that with more, a more customized experience, right? Adding a, a tag that's associated with security policy and providing protection specific for that application. And I mentioned that we created a pair of security policies. So the, the security policies leverage the same tag key but had different tag values. And we used the Boolean, true and false. The idea being that if you had the tag value set to true, that custom rule group that you're setting up is set to enforcement mode, it's blocking. But if you set that to false, it's in count mode, allowing engineers an ability to test out their rules prior to deployment. So this is particularly helpful for them to understand what's actually going on and ensuring that the AWS WAF is performing or the rules are doing exactly what they intended to do. And I touched on this a little bit already, but uh, Secure, uh, security man, the security team managed the, uh, that last rule group, right? That creates that safety net to ensure that all our resources are being protected with at least these rules, right? We can expand that coverage with those tag-driven approach, but we at the very least have these security controls that, uh, that are protecting us from like OWASP top 10 and things like that. Um, security managed this on both uh, globally inherited rules as well as this tag-driven approach. And we can see what this looks like on the, uh, on the right where you have the first rule group where uh, you have your engineering teams managing this, right? So these are your, your rule groups for WordPress, right? Something cu custom, something specific that you're trying to uh, address. And then you have the bottom, the last rule group, right? Which is what security is, is using. Uh, this is what security is managing. These are the baseline controls. And you can see that you can create a very customized solution by adopting both, right? Give you the best of both worlds. All right, so 
Let's see what this looks like from an architectural perspective. So the, architect, the architecture is actually broken up into three different pieces. So if we focus on the first piece, uh, we can see that we followed a very developer-friendly, developer-first approach when it came to this. So everything started off with GitHub. You essentially create a uh, PR request against a GitHub repo, and what they're doing is cr crafting up their own WAF rules, right? And, what and this is actually done by instantiating a Terraform module that the security team owns, a module that was creating these security policies and creating all the plumbing, everything needed for you to get started. So engineer makes a PR request, right? Uh, they crafted the rules, right? So let's, let's use that WordPress example again. They wanted to add PHP rules, some specific concerns, maybe a rate, uh, rate limiting rule. They apply it, Terraform will run, we create a security policy associated with it, and it's associated with that tag, right? The pair policy, so you have uh, two security policies created, both sharing the same tag key, two different tag values, right? The whole true and false thing that I mentioned earlier. So you have this, so now they have this uh, tag, they can go take this over to their AWS resource, right? And we're, and we're looking at uh, global resources like uh, CloudFront, regional resources like Application Load Balancer and API Gateway. They can simply add the tag to that resource and then automatically get these uh, WAF deployed and add it to that resource and get the protections that they need. If you start to look at the second part of the diagram, you can see that this is all being tracked by AWS Config. So AWS Config is looking for changes to these AWS resources, the global and the regional, right? As a tag is applied, the, web, the proper web ACL is, at, is attached to that, uh, to that resource, thus protecting it. Likewise, if they have to swap out rules, change the values, all this is being controlled, being looked at by Config, and we're constantly just making this whole, the whole experience a lot more dynamic for, for engineers. And very customized too, right? Like they can, they can do exactly what they need to. Uh, now, looking at the third part of the diagram, we mentioned the, the importance of observability, right? We want to have strong observability to understand what's going on, right? So we did all the plumbing by leveraging the same Terraform module, and essentially we gathered all the HTTP requests, we funneled it through Amazon Data Firehose, and it pushed it over to an open search cluster. We, back, we also backed up the data in S3 for, for logging purposes, and then we allowed our engineers, our Twilions, to come in and access, uh, access the open source cluster via SSO. They could just single sign on, we use, we use Okta as our IDP, they would SSO in, and now they have access to, this, uh, this, uh, to their logs. They have dashboards, they have stuff that they can leverage to make informed decisions on how to best protect their resources. Right? They, can add, they can look at what the rules do, leveraging that count mode, right? see what's, what's happening, ensure that it's doing what it's supposed to do, swap it over to, uh, to um, True and start to block uh, traffic. All this being made very easily by leveraging the open search uh, cluster. So this is actually what the uh, little screenshot of what the open search, uh, our, our open search dashboard looks like. So as you can see, we're, we're capturing different metrics, right? We're, we're looking at the allowed request versus the block request. So this is helpful, right? If we see a spike in block, uh, block traffic, that might, that might be indicative of an issue. Right? We can create an alert, and fire off an alert, and have the right team follow up on it. We're also capturing the, uh, the executed uh, WAF rules, right? the top 10 executed WAF rules, so we understand what's actually happening, which ones are, are the most active. Right? We have a map of the world so that we can see, we can ensure that we're following our OFAC requirements. Right? Where is traffic originating from? Get some more information. Um, we also added a filtering area to allow engineers to customize, pick exactly the, the application that they want to look into, drill down deeper, it makes it the whole experience a lot more interactive, a lot, a lot easier for engineers to leverage. Um, in addition, Open Search actually has really fantastic role-based access controls that you can leverage. So what we ended up doing was uh, we ended up creating Okta groups that are associated with a specific index and uh, a specific AWS resource. So if you wanted Team A to have just access to their specific applications, we can do that. We can get an Okta group specifically for them. Uh, attach it to that index, and then they'll be able to access the open search dashboard by logging in and seeing just their data and nobody else's. This is allowing us to follow that principle of least privilege, which is what we, you know, we want from a, from a security standpoint. All right, so uh, let's recap, right? So we started off with that challenge of, you know, of scale, right? Those growing pains. Well, we've been able to solve this by using an infrastructure code methodology that really allows a self-service mechanism using you know, a GitOps approach to allow us to create security policies to globally manage our WAF rules. Um, that issue of you know, our dynamic nature, right? The, the coverage where we're adding new resources all the time, well, we're auto-enrolling 
um, the, the WAF automatically when, uh, and when um, resources come online, right? We're looking at config, config notices a new resource being spun up. It's going, to, it's going to go ahead and add that global policy, right? So we have those protections. Likewise, if you want to customize it, well, we can use the tag-driven approach, apply the tag, it'll get, it would override the web ACL and include the custom rules along with the uh, security uh, baseline rules. The issue with visibility, well, we're able to solve that as well, right? Um, now we're using open search to collect all this information, right, and make and allow engineers to make informed decisions on what's actually happening with their uh, specific uh, WAF rules, right? They're, they're able to test it. They're able to see what's going on. They can create alerts. We have centralized logging. Really powerful way to provide observability of their uh, their resources. Uh, lastly, if we go into the whole time to remediate issue that we brought up earlier from the vulnerability management team perspective, well we can now decrease the time to remediate quite greatly, dramatically, because the security team is managing that last rule group, right? So as they start to add a new signature, a new rule that needs to be applied, they can just add it there, add it, add it to that, that bottom rule group, and it's automatically inherited on both the global policies as well as the tag-driven policies, allowing us to deploy a rule, deploy a, a WAF rule in a matter of minutes, really dramatically reducing the time to remediate for vulnerability management teams. So I hope this was helpful in understanding how you can use AWS native solutions to uh, deploy a WAF strategy and help you protect your APIs. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Syed for some closing remarks. Thank you, George. All right, so at the, as we wrap up this uh, talk today, I wanted you to have some key takeaways, right? What do you take back from this talk to your work and implement it? The first thing was using a framework. Securing your APIs is a lot like building a building, right? Building a house, you need to have a strong foundation that you can build on top of. Using a framework, whether it is a OWASP top 10 framework or API security framework or the web, uh, well architected framework allows you to think holistically and ensure that you're building something all the way, covering for all the different aspects like identity and data protection and such. Starting with a developer. Right? This should be a, a non sequitur, but as you think about it, your biggest customer for something like this is your own internal developers. And if you make it easy for them to do the right thing, they're going to just do it. If you take Twilio's example, they provided them the Terraform modules. The developer didn't have to think about it. All they had to do was like add the right tags and then go ahead and do it. Uh, so making sure that you have that developer centricity in your approach is key. Third one is automating. Now automation can be a dual sword, as in you can automate a little too much. And how do you automate? Here, the key thing to remember is automate where you get the most reward on your automation, as in automate those activities that are the most tedious, the, the most time consuming, or you're doing most frequently. So you can, so your analysts, your human beings can focus on the real high value work and let automation take care of some of the things like using config to ensure that your resources that are coming on board get the appropriate protections. Then last but definitely not the least is ensuring observability. That allows you to detect and remediate issues. You are going to have issues. Your environment is going to have vulnerabilities, like it or not. Right? Ensuring having that deep observability can help you remediate those issues as they arise in your environment. And having to change rules based on your apps uh, behavior or a new feature being released and then having uh, if you have the deep observability you can say oh we launched this new feature in our app but that causes these issues so we're going to change the rule behavior to accommodate that so great um, as we wrap up here are some resources that we would like to help you to secure your API from the foundation to the edge right first here is the OWASP API security challenges right this is when you take your phone on and take the pictures. <laughs> so this will give you all the API security challenges that the o uh, Open Web Application Security Project gives you about thinking about uh, API security. The second one is a well-architected security pillar. There are multiple pillars within the well-architected framework, but this is the security pillar. This is the one that tells you all the best practices AWS has learned helping millions of customers like you in helping them with their applications. And then, if you want to get your hands dirty, here is a link to the well-architected hands-on labs. You, this, this you can play, uh, deploy in your own environment and figure out how it works and see for yourself how to use it in your own environment. 
So with that, I would like to thank you so much for being here today. I hope you had a wonderful reinforce. Uh, we would really, really appreciate uh, if you could fill out the survey so we can continue to make this talk better in future iterations for audiences like you. Um, we will be around the corner to answer any questions you have or invite us to your next happy hour. Thank you so much. Have a great day.